Maybe. Yeah. All right. Okay, go ahead, sister. Well, good morning, everybody. Let us close our eyes. And as we close our eyes, allow yourself to be embraced by the divine light. As you give thanks to God for awakening you this morning, our God, who is so merciful, who is so full of love and joy, and who shares this beautiful planet with us and allows us to embrace each other and come together. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for this opportunity. And we give thanks to all the invisible beings who work with us and pray for us. We thank you, Father, for the, the joining of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank the beautiful vibration in which comes from the divine grace that connects us to you, Father, to your heart, to this planet. And we ask you, dear Father, to open our minds and our hearts to accept the lesson that we receive today with grace. May you bless this morning's service. In your name, so be it, as we open our service. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Kiki, if you don't mind putting the... The agenda? Yeah, please, I appreciate yeah. that. But welcome, mm -hmm. everybody, to our Sunday service of our Missouri Spiritist Healing Center. Uh, as we know, we are going through some very interesting times in our sit personal situation uh, throughout the planet. And it is very important that we have in consideration that it is our job to really seek uh, the spiritual guidance for our need to overcome this period of uh, transition that we're going through. Visaya Spiritual Healing Center offers a number of services that is available to anyone that is interested on personal development and also on your inner transformation. Uh, we have uh, a listing of uh, all the services that we provide throughout the week. If you have access to a, the internet, bshcenter.org is our website. And uh, here's a listing of uh, the services that are provided. Uh, Mondays, we have a what we call the Healing Services for Mediumship Group which is an internal group that focus on providing healing at a distance uh, to those that are interested in obtaining that kind of a support. On Tuesdays, we have study groups from 6.30 to 8 p.m. We have forgiveness as the way and the way to forgiveness, uh, which is conducted by our dear sister Sunshine to her divine light site. On Wednesdays, 4 to 7 p.m., we have uh, fraternal assistance, which is an assistance provided to those that wants to have individualized attention in conversation with some of our mediums uh, regarding the spiritual, physical, and emotional uh, situations. So that's uh, done by arrangement of a, a scheduled time. Between 6.30 and 7.30, we have another group studying psychology of gratitude. And it's an amazing material that uh, leads us to understand how the posture of being grateful for all what we have, it's uh, in synchrony or in synchrony with the healing uh, state of mind and physical. On Thursday, another group, study group, is studying Living Spring an amazing book that uh, uh, the lessons are so actual and uh, pertinent to our daily needs. And today we have our Sunday services. Uh, and as soon as we have the Sunday service, we have the healing passes, which is a complement of uh, the presentation that we, we received this morning. And in the afternoon between 5.30 and 6.45, uh, another study group by Sunshine 
working with the book Workers of the Light Eternal. It's a book study, and uh, we invite you all to participate and to join in uh, as it is important for our progress. So with that, I'll pass it along to our host to welcome our presenter of today. Have a good day, everybody. Have a great week. Thank you, Charles. And Laura, I'm sorry, just before... Um... Just before, before turning over to you, I just wanted to also remind and reinforce that we have the daily prayers. So every day at 6 p.m., we get together for us to vibrate, not only for us, but also for the entire planet Earth. So everybody's welcome to join us. It's in exactly the same um, link. Good. As we, as we are registering YouTube, I would like to suggest, uh, Kiki, if you can please... Uh, read uh, and present our, our, our dear sister, Laura, today. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, so Laura Uplinger, am I pronouncing correctly your name, Laura? Okay, so our dear sister, Laura, accepted the invitation to come talk to us about um, such a beautiful topic, the power of a pregnant woman and their mission. And for those who don't know, I am pregnant as well. <laughs> so this is, this is a gift for me to be here listening from you. And for those who do not know Laura, she's a student and educator in the field of conscious conception, pregnancy, labor, and breastfeeding. Since the late 1970s, she has been a proponent of the powerful influence of mothers in her life has on the formation of the baby during pregnancy and the breastfeeding month. From 1988 to 1999, she served on APPBAH Board of Direction, which is Association of Prenatal, Perinatal Psychology and Health, and is currently the, the Vice President of the Brazilian Association for Prenatal Education, with whom she coordinates trainings and seminars. Also, she lives in São Sebastião, a beautiful small city um, in Brazil, uh, by the sea at the state of Sao Paulo in order to volunteer at a gestational center found, funded by the local city hall and dedicated essentially to the well-being of pregnant women. Thank you for doing that. She was born in the U.S., have dual nationality, and graduated in applied psychology in France in the 70s. And we are extremely happy to have you here. It's extremely honored. So thank you for coming. And please... Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you, Kiki. Um, the theme I bring today is a universal one. All of us were born, so all of us were conceived at some point, even those conceived in vitro. And um, so to be born is something we've done since the beginning of times. And since the beginning of times, traditions always brought this information that the inner life of a pregnant woman was important. Hopi Indians would ask the woman to stop doing her normal things so that she could go more to sunrise and, and have different meditations, different prayers. I mean, from Zulus, Bantus, just name it. The peoples we know about, especially those in India, they even have a Garbo Sanskar, which is a, a, a book of the Uspanishad dedicated to the needs of the fetus. Uh, in Brittany also, in old in England. And then towards the end of the 19th century, science found out about genetics. And there was a complete enchantment with genetics. Suddenly, genetics were the key for everything. And they forgot and decided that all the rest did not exist. That the baby in the womb was developing according to a genetic plan, it was determined. And there was nothing a woman could do, or anybody could do, of course, not, not to exaggerate too much, not to drink too much or smoke too much, but it's only after being born that the baby could be educated. So this went against the grain of everything ever tradition had always brought, but had never been applied, not even in India and in China, who also had a gorgeous tradition. So here's humanity until the end of the 19th century with incredible knowledge about the beauty of a pregnancy and how, how the woman was capable to give the best to a child, but they never applied that collectively. Comes the end of the 19th century, 
whereby any kind of thinking about psychology, but transpersonal psychology came in soon enough. But it, it took the end of the 19th century to have epigenetics, something that is above the field of genetics. And they discovered, and that, that's what I love about science, that they can be really wrong. But if the next day somebody says, hey, we were wrong here, they immediately correct it. Not so in psychology. Oh my, it's certainly not in, in spirituality. Suddenly we have an insight uh, that, um, I don't know, a special branch of Hinduism is not accurate. They will just form another branch, not change mm -hmm. what they're doing. And epigenetics means that, yes, there is a genetic code that will be unfolding. But the way it will unfold, what will be silenced or manifest, depends on the information the membrane of the cell sends to the nucleus. So a mother can be expecting an extraordinary uh, being as capable as Shakespeare uh, to write um, plays and gorgeous works of art. But that woman is very nervous and a huge stress, toxic stress. Perhaps her baby won't even learn how to read or write. And the reverse also happens. Very simple, normal um, genetic material. But she lives an enhanced pregnancy with such a joy and trust in the universe. That kid can write anything and becomes a great poet. So it's all malleable. There's no determinism. Um, we can constantly compose with life. And you guys know it. When I see your agenda, you can help brothers and sisters all over the US. You can help them face their, I don't know what difficulty in a, in a physical level in their body or in their finances or in their heart life. Everything's malleable. Life is always waiting for us to look at it and compose with it. So babies in the womb, this is it. I would invite you to have a detective work and learn what happened nine months before you were conceived, those first nine months before conception. The nine months you were in the womb of your mom or seven months or eight months, but the month or 10 months. And then nine months afterwards when you were probably being breastfed, um, those 27 months, they contain for you a little luggage that you take everywhere with you. We are pulsating memories. And uh, if your families knew each other before you were conceived, if you were dreamt, or if you were avoided, or if you came to replace uh, the loss of a, a child, so many reasons to conceive a child out of love, out of anguish, out of hope, a huge quantity of reasons. But now that they happened, these reasons, and uh, I usually recommend people to check who was um, the president of your country, um, what was going on in the world, in the arts, uh, Hollywood movies, um, what was the flavor? of your culture, it all impacted you. It became information to you because it was certainly surrounding your mom. Um, I've been teaching that field and, and living, and of course, then I also had the blessing of becoming a mom, knowing all this with a, a companion that shared all these with me um, for the last 40, 45 years. And I am very happy that now it has become science. But before there was, you might have heard rebirthing. Um, it's a transpersonal psychology that can take you back to sometimes even prior to being conceived. Yes, tell me, Charles. Oh, <laughs> I didn't want to interrupt you, but no, 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 let's yeah. have it our, it's well, our because I had a personal experience with rebirthing that it. Uh, it kind of solidifies everything that you mentioned about how influential all the circumstances are. 
and rebirthing. It's not called rebirthing right now because of the uh, religious connotations of it, but it's called vivations. It's still a trend that goes on around. And uh, yes, I had my experience with uh, the two of the creators of that uh, program, uh, Leonard Orr and Jim Leonard. Yeah. I was very active. Sure. Um, yeah. I practiced yeah. with them. And uh, maybe some other time I can share my own birth with you guys. Yeah. <laughs> it's well, very interesting. You, yeah. we, keep, we keep all that memory. It's amazing. Yes. yes. And it's very so, challenging, Charles, because to speak about memory of somebody who has a brain, let's say, already an embryo, but a memory of conception, hello? Who is remembering what? It's, it's a moment where science and spirituality cons- coincide. So you have one cell, a sperm, another cell, an egg. They meet. And by the way, that image of, I'll have this race and I'll be the first one. They f- are finding out completely new um, stuff about it. First, a sperm doesn't just go like that in a straight line. It goes circling. Mm-hmm. It's spiraling, if I may say so. And the young ones get, get there first. Their little head is more acid and they unveil the egg. And the egg is also turning around itself. And then comes the moment that we're going to call uh, the, the joining of the two. And the more mature sperm, more interesting to the egg, of course, they arrive later. But they're each different. One of them will be more akin to the vibes of that couple in that moment. If it's an act of love, if it's um, a moment of enjoyment and there's this trust in each other's eyes and each other see a soul in the other, there is joy. If there is, even they want a child, then the situation gets better and better. So the sperm to be chosen will be the one that reflects that. And in India, they even give you advice about the weather conditions. It might sound strange, but if you think electric magnetic fields, it makes complete sense. Um, They ask you to conceive in a day with a blue sky, no wind, no storm, no tempest. And I loved knowing that because in my tranquil ignorance, Mm -hmm. I would have gone for a storm, something gorgeous. No, storms are for afterwards. Build first the very, um, the very perfect condition. Then you can do anything, even a snowstorm. Yeah, I, I love that too, Kiki. And um, so once conception happens, and usually we calculate conception with the ejaculation, that great moment, it's when the father has 100% of the power. Power of what? Of going and picking up the soul already attracted to that couple. And um, it's so important. It's the most important moment of our life, they say in the Vedas, like a fractal. You know, a fractal that will be the, if you take a, a cauliflower and you divide it in two and in three, and you can go to the very last little piece, which is a tiny cauliflower. That's the fractal of the cauliflower. So fractal is something simple. Our conception was our very first fractal. Some people speak about an imprint uh, of preconception. Okay. Already, how that man and that woman were considering each other, there's something there. Some clairvoyants have reported that a man brings with him to the moment of the conception of his child a special energy that will be mainly responsible for the making of the nervous system and the respiratory system and the woman. And when I'm saying he brings it, he also brings it from his father and grandfather. Now the women, what we bring to our baby is a condition for the circulatory system and the bone system or the skeleton. So the more vibrant each of these two beings are, the more more vibrant is their love. The more in sync with nature they will be. Because we were meant to be gorgeous, not just physically beautiful, but inside and uh, 
we're not made for um, so much disruption, so much anguish, so much despair. Some, I see in America, some people already take antidepressive medicine before the baby's born so that to avoid the postpartum depression, which is so absurd. We were made to be born well. And to be well, any one of us will need the biochemistry of joy. It's funny, because now you, they can study that in the biochemistry. So of course, we'll, even a person who is in joy will go away from the joy. It's OK, but then come back to it. Go back to the joy, because that's how our, all our organs will function well. Now, if the woman is pregnant like you, Kiki, you, you take care of your joy. Joy in breathing, joy in smiling, joy in seeing the running tap water. It, it can be the most simple one. Or joy of imagining the angels working. Oh, it's true that in spiritism, you guys don't rely so much on, on angels, but at least entities entities of the light, because this is important. This is who we are. And the more, when I'm pregnant, the more I am in harmony with who I am. I, I cannot become somebody else because I'm pregnant. That wouldn't be fair for the baby who chose me. I have to be completely me at my best. And of course, have my companion. Um, it's so beautiful when, I'm, I don't know what, how you're going through these um, weeks and months, Kiki. But when your companion looks at you and adores you being pregnant, whew, that feeds you such energy. This is life. This is very important. So you all know about spiritual teachings. Well, if there is one moment in life where we should practice them enamorously, uh, with great joy, is during pregnancy. And I always ask pregnant mothers, not to expect just babies. Babies, they, they don't last so much. They become kids and toddlers and this, and then teenagers, and then comes in the adult. A pregnant woman, she's expecting an adult, a future adult. She's expecting the future of humanity. And I might say so, it's not very agreeable, but if humanity has been so mediocre, mediocre all these last centuries and millennia, so many wars, invasions, and, uh, and cruelty, and it's because when we were pregnant all these times, we couldn't really get into being pregnant. Something in the culture of our own families, I don't know. We just reproduced generations after generations. And our history books are not so interesting. They're filled with violence. Which brings me to psychohistory. Psychohistory is a new branch of history. It was born also towards the last um, part of the 20th century. It was created by Lloyd DeMoss, a social thinker. You know, normally, normally history is interested in all the documents and the wars and the peace treaties and psychohistory wants to know what's going on in the in the park, in the nursery, with little ones. The history of childhood, how we treat our kids in a country, in a nation, is the best way to predict how 40 years from now our nation will be. You can almost forget about politics and economics. You know, sometimes they do this, this, they foresee what could happen. They say, no, just go and see how a nation treats its children. And um, there is an interesting man from Australia who was able to write very well about that, Robin Grill. And he wrote Parenting for a Peaceful World. The book came out in 2006, but he, um, he analyzed one by one the countries of the Eastern uh, European bloc, the Iron Curtain, because one by one stepped into a democracy, but not at the same time. And all of them, exactly after some years of having treated their children 
much better than before. We still abuse children in an atrocious way. And it was the norm. If you look into history through the prism of psychohistory, it's a Holocaust. The, the most important mode of parenting was um, the killing of babies, infanticide. Because of we didn't have that much um, preconception possibilities. There, I remember in Rome, ancient Rome, there was a patria poder, the, the power given to fathers. If they didn't want to have a child at that time, they could take the child at the top of a hill to spend the night exposed to the elements and the animals. This was okay. The law allowed fathers to do so. But let's look into these families, our rulers from antiquity. I'm going to ask you some questions. Um, how were marriages in those rarefied uh, layers of society? Were they marriages of passion? Usually they were arranged marriages, right? Because, yes, tell me. I would like you guys to speak. Catherine was going to say something? No? I, I, can, I can chime in. Yeah, definitely they were not marriages of love. And you know that even recently I was talking to a, um, to a friend from India and she didn't want to live in India anymore because her her parents were promising her to another family. And she she met the guy, but then she, I mean, she didn't, she didn't like him. And then I was asking her, like, what will happen? And she know she said, you know, I may end up marrying him because my parents know what's best for me. Who better than myself to know what's best for me? And I found that interesting because, as you said, this is part of the culture, and then you don't even realize what's going on, right? Yeah, and and sometimes we must admit they might be right because we think we have all the freedom, and look what we do with all our freedom. Look at the rate of divorces. Yes. Um, yeah, but they have also proved that their their marriages lasted longer than anywhere else in the world. You know, yeah. Um, yeah. but there, you know, there are some who run. I know a friend of mine who. Um, friend is running from that marriage and so they joined the army <laughs> to get away from it I mean what better place to meet a bunch of dudes right um, but yeah I think that this whole level this whole new generation is um is interesting you know and I was reading in um uh, the wellspring with um Beneza Duno, and he was talking about how um, teachers even teach and how they get hung up in their own head about how the child is supposed to be receiving them. Yeah. And But he came at a different angle. He said, when you got a disruptive child that can't seem to focus or get right, they said, he, he said to ask them how they're doing. You know, come to him like, you know, your friend, you know, approach him from a different angle. How's your family? What's going on? How can I help you? You know, just, um, and, and that's a way of embracing them is to to let them know where you, you care a little bit about them. Yeah, it is true. And there are extraordinary things you can do uh, in a child's infancy and first years of life. My goal, Regina, is to have more and more kids to be born already friends with life, each one in his or her own way, with his or her own gifts and talents. But, you know, people who kind of not glide through life, but who is interested in everything, who doesn't have like a, oof, because usually those come from a neurophysiology that is, I wouldn't say deficient, but incomplete. Even autism, some circuits didn't embrace well. A friend of ours here, at the NAP people, she's a psychiatrist in Brazil. She found out that when the very little one, she's two years old, and you had already you suspect some autism traits, to hold, to lie down on the floor and hold the child, the kid can't stand it, but then you're strong. And the only way will be to find 
to put the gaze, uh, the child's gaze into the gaze of the mother's uh, eyes, which is what they try to avoid. And then, but this done only once or twice, and the circuitry then happens, is already embranched because we will need that circuitry of empathy. You know, autistic children can be so bright. It's amazing their sensitivity. But when it comes to empathy, they don't relate to the other. But let's go back to pregnancy because already for a child to be born with a with a spectrum of autism, something difficult must have happened. But um, we were talking about these ruling classes. Okay, marriages, not always. And sometimes perhaps the couple worked. But when it came to sex, was sex something glamorous, beautiful, gorgeous, sacred? Not always. And very often that couple needed to bring a boy or a girl according to the alliances with other um, ruling families. And uh, pregnancy was fraught with, with dangers and fears, especially of miscarriage or bleeding to death because we can bleed through the uterus, isn't it? it's amazing. And midwives at the time didn't have much understanding, for instance, Nowadays, a woman with practically nothing can help a friend putting just a bunch of ice um, in, the, in the uterus of someone who was bleeding to death almost. But there was no refrigerator, there was no ice. There, there's some things we can do today, in, like in an emergency, and they couldn't. And then would come birth. Um, France in the 16th, 15th century, when a woman would tell her friends that she was pregnant, let's say she was 18 years old, the first letter she would receive was, oh, I hope you don't die. Like almost she, she was incurring a, a danger in her life. Death was sometimes one out of five because of many reasons. But then let's suppose everything went well. The baby was born well, labor was not that difficult, and baby's breathing well, breastfeeding would be a gorgeous moment to kind of re, um, reunite with life and harmony. But breastfeeding was forbidding, forbidden in the ruling classes. A wet nurse had to do the job. I found out about one king of France whose wife breastfed the kids. She was Marguerite de Provence. She was the, um, the wife of Louis IX became a saint afterwards. I think he became blind, time of crusades, but he loved that girl. He married her, she was very young, so they waited to have sex. And when they started having children, they went to breastfeed and it was a scandal, majesty, no. This is, you're a king of friends. Your wife cannot breastfeed. It was something for the slaves, something for the servants. So I am the baby being born. What, what is the message I get? I am not worthy of the presence of my own parents because my, my delicious wet nurse, probably my best friend, cannot even sit at the table with my parents. Do you realize the amount of insecurities that can settle in? But then that kid will have a great education, suppose it's a boy, and will be a ruler someday. So when a person is insecure, one of the most common manifestations of insecurity is aggressiveness, aggression. There are days that I, where I feel I'm much more aggressive. I don't know how to wait in line to a restaurant or something. Other days, anything can happen, I'm fine. We, 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 we have many waves, ups and downs, we normal people. But somebody who practically never saw his or her own parents because the nursery was a nursery. There were times where the mother would go and kiss the baby or the, the child. There was no less family like I'm so fond of you. We still see in England, little ones at the age of nine, 10, going to boarding school. In Brazil, I don't think we would do this. We do worse things, but we at least want to be with our, our children, to hug them. 
And by the way, the very first nation who paid attention to women and children, which is the, if a country wants to evolve, that's the first thing to do. This comes from gorgeous historians like Bernard Lewis, who studied the Arab world. The first nation was the US, United States, after the war. I, I went to, to school in France at the age of eight, nine. And I remember a friend who told me that her father had waited for her to become seven so that he could talk to her. L'âge de raison, the age of reason. So ah, now you're somebody. You know this image that we have often in the US, even in the movies, it's about seven o'clock in the evening and the boss of the father is there for dinner and the kids are in the bathroom, they're getting uh, their little hair combed or wet and they put on pajamas and they go in the living room to say good night to the, to the guests. This was impossible in Europe, but impossible. It's like, I don't know, snow in Brazil, in Rio. It's like, it's a no-no. But then what happens if you start valuing women and children, your nation will grow. There will be inner resources, there will be more creativity, there will be more inner peace, self-confidence, self-esteem. Self-esteem is such a gorgeous kernel of a personality, but when does it start? Some say it's in preconception. Kiki, tell me how, how much longer can I talk because I want to show you guys something. Um, 15 more minutes, if that's okay. I'll go by your, your time. I just didn't see when I was starting. Yeah. There was a, a judge of the Supreme Court in Greece, Supreme Court for Administration Business. And uh, she devised, she's been, I mean, she's in her late 80s, but she's a great friend of mine. I met her in spiritual retreats in France. And she managed to have this 10 golden rules for future parents. I think I sent you one, Kiki. And these 10 golden rules, this is a compendium, very simple, about important principles during pregnancy, about well-being. And since 2008, this is given to um, people when they receive their wedding certificate. So perhaps they're not gonna have children, but at least they have access to what science knows and spiritual, spirituality has always taught. You have quotes here from Plato and Sanskrit. N rule number four, breathing deeply. Joanna, breathing deeply is not a rule to rule. The woman has done rules all her life and, and jurist, and so I, I obeyed. I, I did, a, a friend of mine and I, we did the French version, because she could, could correct, because we don't speak Greek, and then we did the American one. Um, and then there's a Sanskrit proverb, for breath is life, and if you breathe well, you will live long on earth. Now I ask you, Kiki, you're pregnant. Don't you love breathing? Isn't every single um, detail of your daily life enhanced by a special beauty? But nature gives you new scoops of imagination, like, hey, more, I want to feed you. And for you to do some kind of anchoring and giving, if your child is a, is a violinist, you're giving your child a Stradivarius, a gorgeous violin, a piano is a Stanway like the best. I remember James Galway has a flute that is pure gold. We can have children that are gold. All the other metals are very good, but gold, you can't tarnish gold. You have this notion of it's incorruptible. You can bury it, you can go through any situation because life can be hard. But that person, whoops, will come out not always a leader, but certainly somebody who knows how to see clearly into a better future and, and, and do things for it. So there is a huge responsibility in each society. What do we offer our pregnant women? What kind of well-being? Um, 
<laughs> of course, if it were as linear and simple as I'm telling you, already it would be important. But there is another dimension. We are very faithful to how we, we experience, what we experienced in prenatal life. If my experience when I was in my mother's womb was her sheer enthusiasm, every time I'll feel enthusiasm, I will feel faithful to how I came. Because for every child, the way we were in the womb becomes kind of a sample of how things should be. We, we record it in an implicit memory. When I say that we're pulsating memories, not explicitly, but implicitly. And fortunately, if my time in the womb was tainted with lots of fear or anguish, every time I will go in or aggression, every time in life I will meet people with that kind of fear or, or aggression or anguish, I, I even know it's not what I should be thinking or doing, but when I feel it, there's something in me that feels at home. So I'm, I'm going to become somebody very good for Prozac industry. See, anguish, fear, they come spontaneously for many women because of the conditions and how they live. The ones who are privileged, like I was, like Kiki is, to really be expecting, as they say, oh, she's expecting. That expectancy brings light into your eyes. This is fabulous. But we are the minority. And it's not normal to be the minority. This is absolutely for everybody else. I want to show you some a conference I organized in 2007 at birth and the human family um, embracing the power of prenatal life. Okay, the woman is pregnant, she's pregnant expecting a whole planet, but there is a, a star, the sunshine, that society. This is who we should be for her and a source of inspiration. Usually when a woman goes to a medical <laughs> appointment, she will learn everything about every possible malady, every possible disease that can come upon her and her baby. All the exams to prove that the baby's fine. Oh no. I caught a doctor or a nurse or somebody just sense that the baby's well, doing great. They, uh, let's not go into, you can speak about, about this better than I can, but I recommend to all of you a book from um, Geoffrey Hudson. He was a great clairvoyant from the Theosophical Society, and he wrote a tiny book. Um, the miracle of birth, he observes during nine months a pregnancy. He's going to be the godfather of that child. So this friend of his is pregnant, and he describes the whole pregnancy. And towards the end, oh, there's this divine mother that comes with a cloak, um, dark blue, beautiful blue, and is present. And the voices, the entities working and weaving the organs. I... I read that I was in my early 20s, just loved it. And this should be in every classroom, of course, translated in an, a language that perhaps doesn't rely so heavily <clears throat> on spirituality, but on life. Is it in English? And Jeffrey Hudson sounds like an English name. Oh, yes. 1929. The, the foreword is by an obstetrician, and he says, it is in England. Oh, we now have another way of lo looking into pregnancy. This is better than any ultrasound. <laughs> now, there is a book that will delight all of you. Where is it? No, I don't have it here. But it's called um, Babies Are Cosmic. It's a, this book is 20 years of a study. Only about what babies, about children say by the age of one and a half, two, when they start speaking, till the age of four, every child remembers life in the womb. And they say things matter of fact. They don't repeat it, they don't play with it. You know, with a child who's three years old, if one day you wear a cape 
you're going to have to wear this cape for the next year and a half, being so and so. Because they want to reenact everything. But when they give you uh, an idea, I remember my daughter saying, Mommy, I was born. So, oh, my love, and how was it? So I was not afraid. And we ended up having a conversation, like completely spontaneous. I didn't want to make her a guinea pig. But I asked her, and how was it inside, mommy? Because we have to try to not to give the answer in the question, like, did you like being in mommy's tummy? So how was it? She says, it was night. So, so poetical, so beautiful. And, um, and there's a trick question, because sometimes I'm going to have such a I'm going to have such imagination, they can trick you into believing things. So you ask, and what did you eat? And they will look at you, I didn't eat, but I could drink like, you could drink the amniotic fluid. This is every single child. Normally they tell you, oh, take advantage of a quiet time after the bath or before going to sleep. Well, my kid was six o'clock in the afternoon and they had been a mess, people coming in and out. And there she is, mommy, I was born. <laughs> so I had to address the situation. But Babies Are Cosmic of Neil and Elizabeth Carmen is an amazing, amazing book. The same couple wrote Cosmic Cradle for you, all of you who are into spiritism. These are extraordinary experiences of people from all over the world getting in touch with their babies before conceiving them. And there are several books like that. The Soul, Soul Trek is one of them, but this one I also highly recommend. And for those who want to know a little bit about prenatal psychology, <coughs> Parenting for Peace by Marcy Axness is, um, is a gorgeous bouquet of all the other research and uh, in the same paragraph, she can be spiritual, psychological, and scientific. She goes over the, the barrier. Marcy Axness, A-X-N-E-S-S. -S. This was a journalist who got Emmy nominations for her work with CBS and women's health. But when she conceived her kids, she stopped working. She was able to bring them up. She had been adopted. So she knew some things about the, the beginning of life. And when they were teenagers, then she got a PhD in early human development. Marcy is an amazing voice. And the, the English is savvy. Uh, it's a word that describes her very well, but double V, who can invent a double V in a word? And <laughs> yes, there are, there's, there's liter literature. Now, I don't know why so few people know about these books. Why isn't the press, press all over it? In America, we have the divide, the pro-life, pro-choice. Mm -hmm. Let's unite forces. Even Al Gore said that one day. And he said, let's fight the unwanted pregnancy. I would say, let's fight for conscious conception. That would resolve all the issues. But then we would have to reconcile sex and love which is not, a friend of mine asked me, the year I was organizing this conference here, a friend said, would you write a chapter in my new anthology? So what are you writing about? It says, the marriage of sex and spirit. I'll give you right the word. Wow, this is gorgeous, Dawson, but I'm not a writer. Oh, please, please. Well, I ended up writing a chapter. The chapter got um, the, um, edited by the woman who was the head, but there I was. There was Fridjof Capra, Dalai Lama, Carolyn Miss, great names in America. I said, oh, my chapter is going to be so simple. Conscious conception, marriage of sex and spirit. Mind you, mine was the only one who referred to conception. All the other 40-some chapters were about difficulties in sexual life and abuse and this and that and more and more. But the simplicity of opening up for a soul to come. Can you imagine? And this is 2006. So, so it's still this century. Yes, Regina. I think you just answered it. I was just curious about other aspects and what happened. You just answered. I did. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, you know, you were saying how other people were talking about other different things and yours was more focused. 
But also I wanted to know whether or not the, the you were saying that the children and the parents actually communicated, right? So did they talk about what type of life they wanted to have or whether or not the parent was in agreement to what kind of life they would have or freedom? I, I often had this conversation with my husband because we were not clairvoyants and we could not know exactly what the child needed. But one thing reassured us, look, this kid chose us even when, when she was in the womb. So let's be the way we are at our best. Yeah. Let, it's almost a reason to be who we are. I don't know how you feel about it, Kiki. Of course, you would love to be the best person on earth, but life does not allow us to have a baby at the age of 94. So we have to deal with all our shortcomings, our incapacities. We learn that the child teaches us how to be parents. It's amazing. I, yeah, I wanna, you don't come with a book. <laughs> who is who's ready to have a baby? I don't know. I don't know. I don't want no more this lifetime. I'm done. Yeah. Um, Charles, you're you're enjoying some aspects of this conversation. Tell us what you think about all this. Well, it's an interesting perspective because so far our culture uh, has uh, not understand that interconnection between spirit and mind and all that especially when conceiving and uh, going through the pregnancy, because there's a reference about the male pregnancy, which is part of that process. And uh, we're not taking that much in consideration. So I think uh, uh, we're still evolving and we're still gonna get to the point where we will understand the importance of the father's presence throughout the pregnancy, because there's no disconnection. There's no distance. Because right. the energy that is involved is so permeating, it's connected. So the pregnancy is not just a woman, it's also the man's pregnancy. And, and that's not even... Forever. Exactly. That, that, fractal that the father did at conception goes on forever. My yeah. new daughter is still on the, on yeah. the way that was started. My husband in, nine, in 2011, was dying, he died a conscious death, and he was very much awake. He was having palliative uh, care. And uh, I asked him, how come you're so calm? <laughs> he had signed all his papers for cremation and all that. Okay, he was 81, I had not been sick for a while, and just a short time. And he closed his eyes and says, I don't know, but perhaps it's conscious conception. So my goodness, this man conceived three kids. When I met him, he had been divorced already for 10 years, but he had conceived two kids consciously before. Wow. Yeah. So if he's uh, entering the next realm with such peace, he was a gorgeous father, of course. Um, if that conscious conception had given him strength, what beautiful, just that, you're talking about men, look at this. Yeah. So I think uh, we ought to really pay more attention to what is our male's contribution to the whole process and have a better understanding of it. Yeah. it and then of, you have the magnetic fields. Yes. I am, that baby in that womb has 50% of um, his or her genetic material akin to mine. I am vibrating in that womb. I am the man, but I am also there in that womb. Right. It means living that. So, oh gosh, aren't we all connected? Oh, yeah. The little rabbit in the fields to, to a star up in the, in the heavens. <laughs> and, and every time we turn our back to that communion, we lose. We lose so much. Life is there very patient. It's when are humans going to wake up to the, to the beauty of life? So, as the baby is born, there's a drastic change. And well, then life starts. Epigenetics will go on through life. I am pregnant of myself for tomorrow morning, for a month from now, my liver and making it. But the, the, the field, the blueprint of who I am was yeah. given to me during my time in the womb. Can I change it? Yes. Lots of meditation, lots of therapy, lots of effort. 
why not to give already a great instrument? In our current in our current stage of uh, development or, or evolvement, we still need to conquer the aspect of being humans. So we're not uh, quite there yet. I consider you know? myself a subhuman. Exactly. We we're not quite there yet. We're still on the Camino da Luz. We're still on the way to the light. So we have some ways to go. But we are, we are making some movement. Yeah, I want to honor Kiki here because she's going to give birth one of these days. And birthing, being born is also a great imprint. When I am, because from the time I was one cell, two combined that gave one, I'm going to grow, I'm going to develop in trillions of cells. And there I am a baby and I want to be born. Don't listen to those who are going to tell you about the trauma of birth. Birth can be traumatic. Anything can be traumatic. Climbing a staircase can be traumatic. But we are made to be born. All of our organs and senses are made for that. It, it is uh, so amazing um, learning a lot. I learn a lot of you with you, uh, bringing um, all this information and making to think a lot. And I know all of us, even though uh, those who has no children here uh, yet, no, like Dave and Kat, is you know have been conceiving their own child, but uh, and uh, but uh, this is is manifesting in our cells in our memory forever. We are from from this topic today, who our motherhood will be never being the same again. <laughs> will be just uh, an amazing uh, changing right now because as Omar Mike Wyvoyoff said, all the, 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 the cells that need the new information that we allow to come in will be helped to change the old information in ourselves. So bringing this moment in the moment, the moment of the conception. So the man and the pleasure and the power and, and it's like in the force in the moment when you're talking, it's like I visualize this power and the force of God manifesting through the man, through the sperm. No, no, uh, more men know that they have just conceived than women. You mm -hmm. know, sometimes a couple is there, they're having lunch together and then they, they, they make love and time to go back to work. And he gets up from the bed, try to put on shoes and <gasps> we conceived. She said, like, come on. What are you talking about? I know they conceived. Yeah. Have, more men have known about that moment, seeing a gold light, golden light, sometimes the women too. But what I wanted to say, um, Kiki, for you about being born is that the way I am born will lead my ideas about the unknown. You know, some people are terrified of the unknown. Some people are eager to meet the unknown. It has a lot to do with the way we were born. Were we well treated? I come into something totally different, huge change. Blood circulation, breathing, light, the weight, the cold, everything changes. So well, if I want to know how I was born, I would have to ask myself, how do I deal with changes? Well, I'm okay with them. So, okay, I was born, okay. I love change. Ah, and perhaps I love being born. You know, there's a correlation, not a causation, but a correlation. Mm -hmm. And Mark is say, and Mark is just saying uh, he really knew when he well, the, his first son was conceived. Me oh, too. He felt that. Yeah. Can you no. tell us without turning on the image? Can you talk, Mark? <laughs> He's driving. Yeah, but he can talk. <laughs> Actually, I just arrived home like five minutes. Ago. Oh, good. <laughs> fabulous, fabulous discussion. Uh, yeah, I knew it when it happened, we, we've been trying. And I was 45 years old waiting to become a father for the first time. I knew it. I knew it that day. Well, here's another obscure subject. Is the male orgasm. Nobody talks about it. It's amazing. <laughs> it's true. It's true. And, and about a, I, I, I'm thinking, I'm thinking uh, in the moment you said that, and uh, it is, I don't want to put it in, in a negative point, but uh, that I think that is something to think. Uh, and the pleasure of the man, 
the satisfaction on the orgasm. No, they have that power with them. And how about the frustration with the women? No? Well, and, you know, if the woman is happy, uh, wants to conceive, wants to be pregnant, so that is awesome. her love making was good. Already that the very first cell divisions, you know, when they start dividing, multiply by dividing, uh -huh. already the membrane of each of these cells will have more receptors for growing factors. You already can see whoop, this child won't be premature because there will be more stamina, more strength, because you want growth in the womb. You know, when you go to any ex pregnancy exam, they want to see how the growth is going. And um, you can predict by this gorgeous conception that the well being of that woman, her well being is almost more important than her orgasm. But when I speak well being, is her entrega, her surrender. The beauty of lovemaking is in the surrender. And that surrender, the couple can learn it for life because as a parent, you surrender. You are not going to <laughs> manipulate, dictate the life of your children. But during pregnancy, you can connect with subjects. You are the, the, mm -hmm. the owner of the pregnancy, father and mother together. And that's what I love about the little book about the um, Ten golden the rules. Gold, the ten golden rules. Yeah. And mother together, yes. It's a together enterprise. Mm -hmm. And we don't need to be somebody we're not. And life allows for us to have kids better than we are. Mm -hmm. Of course, I cannot ask for a great musician if absolutely nobody in our families yeah. has good uh, hearing for music. We need some genetics somehow. But life allows us to have children way more equipped to live well, especially nowadays. I mean, since the 70s, the doors have been more and more closed to very low specimen and more and more open to better people. So there are many who want to incarnate in couples who love each other. This might be the most challenging part of nowadays. What have sure. we done with love? And the other part you talk uh, was about that, uh, most of us doesn't think about that. Even as spiritist, we we are pregnant and we have an adult. We are de developing that spirit is an adult. It's yeah. not just a, a, a child that, that does not know anything. It's an adult. It's an intelligent oh. being that is projecting, um, uh, engineering, and architecting their, his own life and his own body, using all the chemistry, all they can use to build this new machine that is the physical body, no? And, and that, that is very good to, to you putting that for us to think when I'm pregnant, I'm not pregnant and very responsible. I'm responsible for helping that spirit to manifest in, in the life, no? It's, um, it's strong what you're saying, and, and bravo, because the only thing small in the baby, it's the body. Nothing else is small about this baby. You can see through the eyes. You'll see, um, Kiki, it's easier sometimes to sense the soul when you don't see a baby. But when you see that baby day in and day out, sometimes you think you have that little baby. Well, that little baby is just the body growing. And this is why they sleep so much. They need some time out. It's so difficult to be in a body who doesn't work yet. And when you have a baby, and like you said, your daughter come and talk to you like naturally, spontaneously, uh, I was born, no? And, and when you talk to the baby, just coming, a uh, newborn baby, and you are all looking in their eyes, mentally, don't need a word, you just said, welcome. You're so brave to be here. I, I'm, I'm here to support you. Whatever you need, I will be here for you. They start to talk to you. Uh, they start to move in their mouth and they start to get a different impression, expression on his face or the oh, she face and her faces. And I want to talk to you to express. I have experience when I, I ask, 
uh, I have such a connection with that spirit in that body. And I mentally, I just said, oh my gosh, you are so courage. And uh, where you have come from? And all this mental conversation start. Amazing intelligence start to come in information. So we got in that, that divine orgasm, divine um, uh, time together over like a, um, when you are meditate and your mind is expanded to the other universe. So in that bliss, uh, I could see through the mind of that little baby where he was coming from. And I could see his mind and the pictures of the universe in you know, all the all other planet. And, and I could see the, the environment that he was coming from. And today he's an engineer. Yeah. Spectacular. Thank you for sharing. It is amazing. Uh, uh, when we start to be thinking as an adult, no? Uh, one of the spiritual helpers now, they will, a uh, uh, professor, they will say, stop, stop. And, and, and uh, Omar Michael Ivanov and Master, uh, Master Peter Junov, they always said, stop the child dishes, no? Stop right. being a child, try to be adult, no? Stop yeah. Omar, being adult. Uh, Omram gave a talk in um, 1938 in, in Lyon. He was badly received. The doctors were so against what he was saying about the power of a pregnant woman. They thought he was taking them away from their power because medicine was there for birth. No, they couldn't care less about the woman and pregnancy. And um, several of his books have to do with, uh, they mention an education that begins before birth. It's the real education. It's an education molecular, uh, cell by cell, system by system, and you can enhance the genetics or diminish the values of genetics. It's in women's power. So it's in the couple's power, because when I see woman, it's, I see the couple. Now that we are doing so much in vitro, so much for, um, assisted conception, and so many complications and surrogate and a sperm from somebody in the womb of somebody else, and all. Oh, no. We are playing God. Cosmic intelligence lets us do that. Okay, um, it's possible, but it's not the same thing. It's not the same thing because it didn't come from that warm embrace. Embryos are kept at a temperature minus one hundred and ninety some uh, Celsius degrees. No human cell should ever know that cold. Yeah. And. Um, because of nitrogen, it needs to be very cold. We're, we're playing, we're almost capturing souls in there. And then you're dying and what a mess. I am, those moments are the moments that I'm very happy not to be clairvoyant mm -hmm. because yeah. uh, I don't want to really see all that mess only because I want. You see, we don't, we don't know how to receive a no from life. Mm -hmm. Life will tell no sometimes. And that's it. We, thank goodness in spiritism we have many lifetimes. So we know that, oh, I've had children in so many lifetimes. But in this lifetime, I'll have other kinds of realizations, perhaps of a family. But um, I see here in Brazil the very poor, and then the trance having babies and refusing the polarity. Polarity is one of the most important languages of nature. You take a fruit. You cut it um, in the masculine way, you open it, and you have a little vagina, and you cut it in the feminine way, and you have a sun, you have a star. Everything we touch upon has a polarity. Why wouldn't man and woman be a polarity? Why should we mess endlessly with these? Doing surgeries in children, performing changes of sex oh. if cosmic intelligence accepted of course i will accept i'm here to embrace anybody who needs my help but not to sign under those procedures uh, it doesn't make sense
It's interesting. Well, we need a seminar <laughs> with you. <laughs> I would just say that it's interesting to see your perspective on that, Laura, because um, I was trying to conceive for a long time and um, IVF was one of our options. But it's funny because I wasn't <laughs> really harmonized with that, even though I respect science and I think that it's beautiful. Um, to your point, I think it's it's important that we understand that the conception is so much more than the science behind that. And we can feel that now that I that I was blessed to be able to conceive naturally. As you were as you were speaking, I took so many notes. Um, I still have to reflect and digest and feel um, everything that that was said. It is so um, interesting to feel this energy, and it's interesting because when we are consciously understanding what's going on, everything gets so amazed, and I can be so mesmerized with everything that is going on. It is as if I could feel her. Um, more than in the physical sense, I can feel her energy, I can feel her love, I can feel her light, I can feel her fears in terms of what's going to be of me of the world and, and I can talk to her and I just get emotional because it is some, sometimes whenever like I feel her, and I would just give an example, whenever I feel her sense of anxiety about what's going to happen if I need something and then husband comes to me immediately and then he takes care of me about something and I didn't even tell him about anything but I can feel their connection through me um, and then I can feel everything being peaceful again so it is um, it's difficult to explain it's really hard to explain but I think that to your point when we are conscious about the conception and what's going on, we are able to feel the pregnancy so much more. And when I say we, I'm not saying just like the, as the woman of the relationship, but like definitely, excuse me, definitely my husband, um, understanding my needs, my physical needs, my emotional needs. So when I know that the hormones go up and down <laughs> and when I get like a little bit more emotional about something, he embraces me. And all of that makes sense in terms of daughter, you know that everything will be all right. And she knows that. So yeah, it's a huge responsibility, but when you look into it, it's so pure. So safe. Yeah. It's so pure. Oh my gosh. I hope I, I wish we could stay here forever and talking. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Um, so we are um, already over in time, but if anyone would like to bring any questions or any comments, I, I, I don't know, Tanya, I can't stop it, but um, I would encourage to reach out to her. Um, Laura, I think that one of the things that would be nice is if we could, um, all the books that you mentioned, Maybe I just would like to write them down to everyone so then we can make sure that people can access and then I can direct them to you. Okay. I'll give you a little bibliography afterwards. I'll send it to you. Okay. That's yeah. Yeah, those are, you guys are lucky to read English. I'm, I'm, it's so tough here in Brazil because very few of these books are translated into Portuguese. And um, this is a moment where people should be reading um, English. Oh, Mark, you're welcome. Thank I'm you. glad they have you. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I really, really want to have you for the future for continue this topic. Uh, I, I love the way you putting it the conversation. Uh, my gosh, I learned so much today. And, and that uh, you answer so many questions today that I have and uh, open my mind for other, other topic. And, and one of the dreams, since I, re I read about your program a long time ago, uh, who brought your program to us was Valerie United from French. And I think it was 2015. 
14 or 15, she talked about your, your, your beautiful work in Brazil and uh, your beautiful presentation of, I think, 20, 2007. And uh, she encouraged us. And since that time, I, I, I said, oh my gosh, that as a alternative therapist, and, and, and that what I, I want to, to ask to, to engage the mothers preparing, like you said, the 10 uh, golden rules when the, uh, before being married or, or for the, the future mothers to know that rules and all, already to prepare themselves because the mentors are always said, uh, we need to invest in the women's to be a better mother for the better for the futures of these nations. I'll send you this book here, La No Ventre da Mamãe. I already have the translation in English. I don't know if it's oh, going to Oh, wow. Be. You see? It's a story of a little girl. She's four or five years old. And she tells us how her mom is carrying this conscious pregnancy. And it's mm -hmm. so adorable. But in the end, this friend of mine was a writer. The freedom of an artist. We said, this little girl is too mature. The way she speaks. How can a little girl speak like that? Well... She, in fact, the one, the woman here is pregnant and inside her womb is the mother of the little girl. And so they come from a lineage of women who knew how to watch sunrise wow. from the womb and dedicate their lives for a, high, for a higher purpose. Wow. And I'll send it to you. Thank you. And so that is so important, the consciousness of the women. To, to bring, to manifest the amazing ch children of God and this dimensional world that we are because we are progressing. And, and we are not uh, uh, 5,000 years ago, even uh, 200 years ago, we are progressing. And that is one thing we have to afford. Like, like Charles said, uh, no one talks about the man orgasm, no? No, nobody talks about that. Nobody talks about the moment of conception, the peaceful, the harmony, the love, that moment of conception. That is very important because a long time ago, uh, a spiritual mentor brought to me a meditation to, this, to, to erase in the energy level, the negative energy information from the ancestors beginning before conception, before conception and during conception and the nine month of pregnancy and uh, this, the, 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 this divine source uh, showed to me in my clairvoyance to how to scan all these times and separate the times. And, and uh, I will tell you as a sensitive, every time, before the conception, the conception, how the spirit feels and prepare the anxieties. The, the, if the mother will accept this, if you continue the wound, if it will be not abort, uh, uh, have abortion there. And uh, how will be the acceptance. And then and the, uh, and the he already or she already knows who, uh, because the, the, the spirit is bringing, uh, is brought to be living in the same environment that the mother lives. So, so we know the mother energy to, to, uh, to have affinity and harmony. So make a long story short. So every day of the nine months is very important to assimilate uh, with your topic of nine months before, nine months during pregnancy and nine months after pregnancy. So that is the meditation the spirit uh, taught me to not nine months before, but he said before conception, during conception, uh, uh, during pregnancy and after pregnancy uh, is important to scan her. And uh, every time, every day that I scan her, I will tell you, I, I could read a story, the, the mother minds, 
emotional, what she was living in the environment. Like you said, uh, how, who was the president? How environment you were in that moment of pregnancy? Uh, the music, uh, the tragedies, you know, all the things will be, you have to, to know that energy because when you scatter that, every cell absorbs that information. So the mother's conscience, like Kiki in this situation, she can just do a meditation, go back every day and said, all this negative energy that was absorbed today, it is separate from us. We are not a part of it. This is a part of the old world, the old mentality. You are being born inside this new environment, the love of God, the divine wisdom, the divine love, the divine light. You are manifesting, you are living, breathing and eating, being fed on this energy. So every day you clean the negativities, like we take a shower, no? And know you take an, a, a cosmic shower and will help your the baby in the wound to not be born with that information. So in that, in that technique, I help a lot of people today to take off pho phobias during the pregnancy. Uh, uh, all, all the mental and emotional abusive situation. Uh, even I treat three kids that was adopted in Brazil by uh, one of the director the, uh, from FBI in Brazil. And uh, she uh, and her husband was uh, uh, from the FBI too. So they adopt three children. And uh, the three children was found in the garbage. One of them was full of ants. And that child was about five years old and poop everywhere. Poop and pee. And uh, he was the most lovely. Every time he looked at me in my eyes, he would say, help me. You can help me. And I, I worked for two years with that child. Would be a wonderful book. And uh, but two years today, he's a lawyer. Wow, the other child, the girl, Lydia, Lydia, the other child, uh, is a psychologist. Wow. And Paulo, Paul, he is a lawyer. So the three children, they was having experience, but I worked with them for two years and was very important. Everything they go through. Uh, for a lesson for me was what the mother uh, have to put them to adoption or abandon them, how the, the stage of mind they were to. And, and it was very important. That is why I say the spirit mentors helped me to understand their mind, to, to read where they come from and why they have that situation. Because in the spiritism, we just are always paying karma. Oh, he did badly on the other life. We, we, we are out of this. We have to be more focused and, 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 and manifest the truth, the love, not in the past anymore. We have to bring consciousness, cosmic consciousness from who we are. Like you said, you, you said amazing that we need to be an adult. We need to know that we are bringing an adult, a spirit, a divine intelligence being that need us they uh, we are not here to transform or change that what they are coming for we are here to support them to help them to 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 complete their their task their mission and their role i'm sorry to speak to my i'm so motivated and i'm so touched by your your speech today thanks so very much wish you come back soon <laughs> Thank you. No, it's just gorgeous listening to you. And yes, please write a book about that little boy who's now a lawyer. That that would, could could help hundreds of people because it's a nowadays book. If I'm found in the in the trash, in the garbage, and with ants all over me, I mean my fate is done. Not so, because we can interfere. I said, love it. And perhaps one of the most beautiful um, parts of the 
Western world is that we interfere, we go and help. In India, they say, no, it's their karma, leave them alone. No. They're, they're, it's important to know about karma, but it can hinder lots of, lots of goodwill. And we need to mix both universes, the East and the West need to, to meet. But I was going to say that we also have the help of the four elements about this cleansing, right? So earth cleanses and I can put my fingers in the, in the soil. And uh, of course I can greet the, the element earth and ask for all my energies to be down, down in the inner laboratories and sent back to me cleansed. But then with the air, it's more for the mental, can purify thoughts. But with the water, can wash feelings. So I, I love that part of um, shamanic initiation of Omram, always giving a special place for each of the four elements. Elements, yeah, the fire being the one that sanctifies. And it's for the soul, for the spirit. Again, you know, there's also, Perhaps the last thing, uh, thing I will tell you, we have a sun ray. It's the etheric level. But if you solidify it in, on our planet, it becomes gold. But if you want to see a sun ray of gold in a liquid state, they say in the Vedas, it's the semen, semen of an, a pure man. It's... We are made of light. And then you can study the biophotons. There's a tiny particles of light go into the DNA and biophotons, something science has discovered recently. It's all about light. The initiates, the great masters, they knew about it. They told us about it. And now the little science that we have already can reveal so much. So we are here for the light and by the light and with the light. And let's make it a delight. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you so much, Laura. Thank you. God bless you, dear sister. How beautiful was. Are you going to have a, a, another one of those talks? <laughs> yes, <Yeah>. definitely. <laughs> yeah, we'll definitely schedule with you a second round. Um, and I would like to thank everyone who were able to stay here. We will take one minute break, very, very quick, just for us to stretch very, very fast. And um, then we return. Go ahead. And the mentor suggests just to have the passes. We are already back in these amazing blessings. It's just having the passes and, and then prayer, closing prayer. Okay. Uh, when, thank you. All the best to all of you. Bless you, sister. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.